Rob Forkner um, going to be talking on, this is the title, why don't I go ahead and jump to the, the slide, the first slide here. Okay, so yeah, impacts of Aptoalbion OAE. So yeah, Aptoalbion being, what is that, about 100 million years ago? Yeah. More or less, Some, sometime in the Cretaceous, an anoxy event that happened in the Gulf of Mexico. The gong, as we, we shorten that. Um, so yeah, Rob uh, presently works here in Portland as a senior uh, geodata scientist at Air Sciences, doing analysis of air quality dispersion. Um, prior to this was at Black Diamond Exploration, that's in Austin, Texas, uh, looking at the global carbon cycle as, as part of your work there. Also worked at a whole host of companies, including Equinor Research, uh, doing carbonate stratigraphy. So a lot of his background being in carbonate stratigraphy. Uh, worked at Shell in the Netherlands for a while, also Maersk in Denmark. Um, and in terms of education, got his PhD at the University of Texas at Austin. And that again was focused on carbonate stratigraphy. Got an MS in geology at Baylor University. There was a soil science piece in there. Right? So, wow. Had, had to shout that up, you Scott. Oh, I love and also got a BS in geology at Baylor. Um, so yeah, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and let Rob take over. I will mention that if you have something you wanna say, uh, a question during the talk and you're in person, go ahead and raise your hand. Rob can uh, call on you, but if you do, please just repeat the question so people online can hear. And then if folks online, if you have a question, um, you're also free to ask one, but not verbally. Go ahead and put it in the chat, send it to me. Okay, and I'll ask Rob the question. Sound good? Okay, thank you. So yeah, Rob, why don't you go ahead and uh, take it away? Well, thanks everyone for for being here. It's a, certainly a treat for me to come and give a talk in person. Like I was mentioning to a few of you, this will be the first time in pushing two years that I've given a talk in person. So this is nice. And the other thing that's nice uh, about this is that I'm talking, uh, I feel like to a room of people who probably aren't very familiar with the topic. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but certainly around uh, Central Texas and, and the people I've worked with in industry, uh, this particular section and these particular rocks were ones that people drove past pretty often. So it, it wouldn't have been sort of an alien thing uh, for many people. Um, so I want to start off with the first slide here, and it's, it's a gorgeous little picture uh, and from a place not far outside of Austin, a little bit to the north of Austin there. And it's, it's a little place called the Narrows. And it's called the Narrows because the little cuts in the rock there are very narrow. And um, it's an interesting thing because this is one of the very few coral dominated reefs in the middle of the Cretaceous. If you know anything, or remember from maybe paleo class or something like that, you, know, you might remember that there's an index fossil for the Cretaceous. Anyone remember what an index fossil is? One or two people might. And, and those, those would be fossils you would find that are indicative of the time period, right? And in the Cretaceous, one of the index fossils is something called a rudist. And a rudist is an animal that sort of filled the same niche in biology as a coral. It was like a clam, it was a bivalve, but it looked like kind of a combination of an ice cream cone and a trash can. And the animal lived in the ice cream cone and had a little lid on the top and it popped out like Oscar the Grouch every now and again uh, to filter feed. And they filled the same niche as corals uh, during the Cretaceous. But at certain periods in the Cretaceous, this period being one of them, the Aptoalbion, the rudis more or less disappeared. And there were opportunistic organisms, uh, in this case, corals, that took over uh, the time period. And you can go to places like this, they're pretty rare, but beautiful places, and see coral reefs from the Cretaceous, which is an interesting thing. Um, I also want to give a bit of uh, credit to the co-authors here. Uh, this is a, a mishmash of a lot of different data and a lot of different work. It's not just pure geology. There's said strat, there's geochemistry, organic geochemistry, and some uh, biostrat as well to lock all of this down. And so I want to start off with a, a couple of slides here that illustrate um, these sorts of intervals that, that we're talking about here uh, in, in sort of in the title. The title has this, uh, this, this word in it, oceanic anoxic event or OAE. 
And um, this is a, a, an area or a subject that's re received quite a bit of attention, I would say, in the past 20 or 30 years, especially. And, and most of the original work there would have been done in this particular area uh, on the right, where we have the succession of chalk. This is all pelagic material. So it was uh, deposited in about one kilometer water depth. And the chalk, of course, is made up of uh, small, tiny organisms called coccoliths. And the coccoliths uh, produce uh, little carbonate wheel-shaped skeletons. And when they die, uh, the sugars that hold those skeletons together uh, degrade and they fall down and form this ooze. And the ooze then compacts and lithifies to form chalk. And um, in Italy, in the Apennines, uh, not too far away from Rome, you can find these successions of chalk and they go on forever and ever and ever. And every once in a while, you'll see these jet black streaks going across the chalk, just no warning, just there they are. And there, there's a few of them there. This particular one is called Livello Bonarelli. And it was named after the geologist who did a lot of the initial work on it. Um, and it is it certainly in the, in the bottom half, completely carbonate free. There's no carbonate at all in it. And uh, going then up, starts to, to show a, a return to carbonate sedimentation. In West Texas, we have the equivalent in outcrop here. Of course, you can see from uh, how sharp that contact is, there's probably a little bit of an unconformity there. There's, and there is, but not too much of one. Um, uh, this particular contact is between two formations. The underlying one you can see is heavily bioturbated, right? There's a lot of burrows in it. So you can tell that there was there was some life uh, existent at the time that was churning the, the sediment uh, there, probably shrimps and crabs and these sorts of things. And it was relatively shallow water, we think. And on top of that is an organic rich uh, rework deposit that we call the Eagle Ford Formation. And I'm sure some of you would be familiar with that for formation, especially if you're paying attention to uh, anything related to oil and gas. And, and the reason is, is because that particular formation is full of organic material. And, and has in some places uh, matured cracked the carriage and, and produces hydrocarbons in the subsurface. So this, this is going to be a story that, uh, that I'm allowed to, to work on because I was working in the industry and got industry, uh, or interested, I should say, in these particular uh, deposits, why they occur, and, and of course, how the carbonate environment was reacting to these particular events. Um, being a geologist interested in carbonates, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Carbonates are really a record of, of life, especially in the shallow marine realm. And, and the rocks themselves, of course, are made of the, the bodies and material of living organisms. They live, they grow, they die. Their bodies fall down to the, the sea floor and become the rock that then is limestone or dolomite later, to uh, diogenesis, of course. And so the, the rock themselves can give you an indication of how the environment was at the time and how it changed through the succession. So carbonates tend to be a very good recorder of, of how environment changed through time. And of course, if, if you have a, a series of rocks that are environmental indicators, if you have something like the oceans turning anoxic, that's going to affect how, how the sediments then um, either live or die. And uh, one, one of the, the big findings or one of the big suggestions, one of the big paradoxes in carbonate geology that we still uh, go to was published way back in the early 80s by a man named Wolfgang Schrauber. And if, if you uh, get into sedimentology or stratigraphy at all, particularly with carbonates, you will have read several of his papers. And um, he was uh, uh, one of the, the foundational uh, people in modern carbonate uh, stratigraphy. And one of the papers he wrote was really interesting. Um, what he did was he went to different periods of geologic time where we had uh, sort of empirical dating, uh, uh, binding uh, uh, carbonate sediments. And what he was able to work out was that uh, based on what we know of rates of sea level change, that carbonate sediments should never drown. So the, the ability of, a, of a carbonate producing organisms to produce sediment should always outpace the, the, the ability of the oceans to rise and fall. So the, the carbonate sediment should never drown. And yet in the geologic record, we find drowned carbonate platforms all the time. 
and certainly in the Gulf of Mexico, but also elsewhere. And there, there are plenty of times you'll see uh, carbonate uh, platforms, ma massive carbonate platforms the size of the Bahamas, uh, completely covered in, in deep ocean sediments. And so one, one of the, the issues that Wolfgang brought up was that there's a paradox here. How do we have drowned carbonate platforms if they can outpace sea level uh, rise and fall? And, and what he came up with was that it must be some, some combination of rapid pulses of sea level change and, um, and, and maybe increased rates of subsidence or perhaps a, a, a complete deterioration of the environment. And I have to say that we as, as stratigraphers and the sequence stratigraphers mostly tend to, tend to forget that second point all the time. We, all, we always think of, of sedimentology and stratigraphy being sea level driven primarily. And, and especially on the carbonate side, because carbonates are such good record keepers of sea level change, that tends to be what we lean on. We often forget that if you go through a period of environmental collapse, uh, well, the, the carbonates can die. And so just, just quickly here, uh, I, I don't want to get too much into this idea of sequence stratigraphy. That would be a complete class. I don't, I don't want to do that. But what I want to say is that uh, within this, this school of, of sequence stratigraphy, the idea is that, that sea level change and accommodation change is going to drive uh, the direction uh, which uh, entire uh, sedimentary systems will deposit sediment, either in a seaward position, a completely vertical position, or backstepping if sea level rises and falls. If, if we're talking about a purely deterministic system that's driven by sea level, if sea level rises, shallow marine organisms will track that sea level rise by moving landward where things are shallower. If sea level drops, shallow marine organisms will track the sea level and, and go basinward to be in a shallow marine setting. It's as simple as that, if you want it to be, uh, to be that simple. And so that is, is typically, as stratigraphers, uh, at, at least in, in, in the carbonate side of things, how we tend to track sediments and then predict laterally away from outcrop or away from a well bore where the next uh, sedimentary environments might be in the subsurface, right? And, and so that, that, tends, that tends to be how, how we do things there, except for certain intervals. And, and these particular intervals um, in the Mesozoic were uh, utter catastrophes in terms of uh, what they did to uh, the, the environments. And these particular intervals are called oceanic anoxic events. And I want to tell you um, the name there is a little bit of a misnomer. Okay. Uh, when, when these particular events were identified, they were identified first in, in marine cores from pelagic areas. And it was noted through about, I don't know, 12, maybe 15 different sections throughout the ocean um, that we, were, we would discover these jet black organic rich shales that were all uh, kind of contemporaneous. They're all being deposited at the same time. And there didn't seem to be any reason that that should otherwise be the case. And so the thought was that there was some global event that triggered the deposition and preservation of a large amount of organic material. And since that time, of course, there's been no, uh, numerous studies and we understand that there's quite a bit of variability there within these sorts of deposits. So the name oceanic anoxic event is a bit of a misnomer. The, the events were not wholly oceanic. They, they affected lots of the ocean, but, they, but because the ocean is linked to the atmosphere, um, they affected uh, er areas on land as well. And you, you can see records of this in the geochemistry of even pedogenic carbonate. There's been studies that have, that have found uh, uh, carbon isotope excursions in, in pedogenic carbonate, for instance. And um, of course, the other thing is that although a large part of the ocean went anoxic, not all of it did. Of course, in, in very shallow settings, um, there's still going to be some oxygenation turnover of, of the water column there. And, and finally, the idea that, that these, situ th these um, deposits were a single event has been pretty well uh, disproven. Most of, the, most of the time, these particular intervals uh, occur as a series of preconditions that all overlap, uh, that sort of tilt the system into uh, uh, generating a, quite a bit of organic material and preserving it. Um, so what I've done here is I've, I've, I've provided a couple of diagrams from a paper, a white paper that Hugh Jenkins put together uh, about 10 years ago. And if you're interested in, in this sort of science, that's a go-to paper because 
he's, he's really tabulated just about everything you'd want to know in one paper. And, um, and, and just as a summary, a lot of these sorts of um, preconditions were occurring at the time that we find uh, these particular black shales. So we have, of course, an, an increased accumulation and preservation of organic carbon, that a lot of that is related to uh, the, an increased occurrence of, of plankton within uh, the, the, the ocean system. Most of these events occur in intervals where we have greenhouse conditions, that is very, very warm conditions where we don't have ice at the poles. And, and uh, that means that sea level uh, at the time is going to be relatively high, especially as we compare uh, to today. And one thing that uh, perhaps uh, folks around here, around, who live around all these volcanoes, might be interested to know is that there seems to be a relationship between the timing of these anoxic events and um, the effusion of these large igneous provinces, uh, whether they be in Siberia or India or, 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 other, way, or other places. It, these also tend to occur in times of very low insulation variability, so times in uh, the orbital history of the Earth where you don't have a lot of seasonality. And, and all of this, we think, uh, led to areas uh, of restriction and a lack of circulation within the oceans. So in a relative sense, the, the oceans became somewhat stagnant. And it, what happened then was that uh, you had, especially in, in deeper water, uh, enhanced uh, anoxia that even traveled up into, uh, into the photic zone. There's, there's plenty of evidence, uh, for instance, in some of this talk that we had organisms living within the photic zone that, that were, uh, of course, uh, using sulfur basically as, as their, uh, their primary food source. And then the, the, the oxygen minimum zone would have, uh, of course, then migrated uh, into shallower intervals as well. And there's some thought that uh, while the OMZ is, is typically around, I don't know, about four kilometers depth nowadays, that it might've come up to, to around one kilometer in, in depth. So it really migrated up pretty shallow. And, and what that means is that you, you couldn't preserve a per, uh, uh, sediment carbonate at all there. It would simply go back into solution, of course. And um, you can imagine if all of that's going on, uh, that anything that might be living in the ocean might be taking a bit of a hit. It, they may be having a, a rough time. And of course, that's what we find. There's, there's linked uh, extinctions of, of many uh, of the of benthic fauna in this particular uh, interval. So um, most of the studies I would say uh, that look at OAE, certainly in the Gulf of Mexico and in a lot of basins elsewhere, look at OAE2, uh, the Cinnamonium and Theronia. Uh, a lot of that is because uh, there's been quite a bit of work uh, looking at uh, source produced or hydrocarbon producing source species that are that age. But we decided to look at a different event, uh, which is sort of a coupled event, uh, one that's called OAE1A and 1B. And don't worry too much about the nomenclature of these things. They don't make a lot of sense. There's, they, they've numbered them, but then the numbers get out of order and there's no real sequence to them anymore. So uh, just think of this as some anoxic events that are within the after Albion system about 100 million years ago. And so the purpose of this study really was, um, was to look at one thing. I, I've got a few different things here, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to better understand what the gross stratigraphic response was um, to oceanic anoxia on a broad carbonate shelf. Um, and, and I'll tell you why that's important here within the next figure or two. It really, it really has to do with how we understand and predict um, the presence or absence of facies as, uh, as conditions change in, in the geologic past. So we, what we wanted to do was look at how this particular anoxic event affected the distribution of carbonate producing organisms and how they were distributed in space in the central Gulf of Mexico. Now, um, the central Gulf of Mexico um, was a, a broad carbonate shelf in the Afto Albion. Um, here we have uh, generally sort of where the, the Gulf of Mexico uh, certainly was uh, or is at the time, but the, at, that, at that particular time in the Albion, uh, sea level was much higher. And, and where, we, where I was living there in central Texas would have been right about at that M in San Marcos. And you had um, 
of course, the, the sea had intruded all the way up into where North Texas is, where North Texas is now. And, um, and so what, what you had at, at that particular time, the, these, uh, these carbonate shelves don't exist anymore, were these, these regional carbonate shelves. So you can imagine, you know, Texas is a lot of scrubland and brushland now, but certainly back in, in the Aptian and the album, it would have looked like Club Med. You know, it been gorgeous turquoise water and tropical paradise and all this kind of thing. Except instead of, you know, seagulls and all that, you would have had dinosaurs running around eating each other. And, and certainly we, we find evidence for that too. Um, but the, the stratigraphy there, you'll notice I've got a block diagram here on the bottom right that looks at um, these big thick packages of, of carbonate sediment. And they're bound, of course, by these black shales. Here, one is the Eagle Ford, and, and another one is what we call the Pearsall group here. Uh, again, the names aren't super important, but I might refer to them uh, once or twice within um, this discussion. But the, the, the thing is that uh, certainly uh, Bob Goldhammer, who put this diagram together, thought that those black shales uh, were deposited uh, as, uh, as a response to, to composite sea level rise, right? So you, you would have uh, periods in, in the geologic past where um, you would have several sea level drivers operating in concert to make sea level rise. Um, this is certainly in the geologic past, we, we see these things. And because of the fact that we could trace these shales around several basins globally, the thought was that, that uses your sea level around the world had gone up at that time and had drowned certain portions of the carbonate shelf. And that, that made uh, certainly uh, predictability of carbonate facies globally a little bit easier at that time. And I think, I think we can start to make the argument now that that may not have been the case, that this may, may have been actually a response uh, to anoxia uh, affecting the world rather than sea level rise. And the interesting thing is that because of the fact that these black shales occur uh, sandwiched in between carbonate facies, is that you can see them in seismic really, really well. And seismic, of course, it are sound waves that are reflecting off uh, thick stacks of rock there. And the sound waves go really, really fast through carbonate sediments, through hard sediments, really, really fast, right? And the shales, on the other hand, slow it down, slow sound waves down really quick. And so you'll get this, this, um, this ringing response off the top of the carbonates. Here you can see the red and blue lines here off the top of the carbonates. And, and that's sort of where the shales are. They're a little bit higher up in here, but you, you can see this response there to the, the shales that blanket the tops of the carbonate system. So they, they, they also provide kind of a nice, a nice thing to see. So what are we looking at? What is OAE-1A? Um, OAE-1A is an early Aptian event that's associated with black shale. And uh, the black shale we think was um, deposited as a, as a result of a deoxygenation and the preservation of a lot of organic material uh, that was uh, living at the time. We think that this particular carbon cycle perturbation was probably related to volcanism. And it's probably the result of increased uh, partial pressure CO2, a uh, combination of that and higher temperatures, greater rates of weathering. We've got quite some isotopic uh, evidence for that. And, and that probably generated quite a bit of nutrient runoff and associated with organic flux that, that led to blossoming of, of uh, phytoplankton and, and zooplankton in, in the water column. The anoxic conditions then and, and the seafloor preserved those, uh, those plankton when they died. And there's, of course, then a distinct negative excursion in, in carbon isotopes at that time as a result. Uh, the other one we look at in, in this group is OAE-1b. And these were a little bit different. So ra rather than what we think of as, as a distinct event, these were four shorter events. And we also think that these probably had to do with pulses of volcanism. But, but interesting here is that um, there was a, a major disruption for some reason in, uh, in the occurrence of plankton uh, within this particular interval. And we lose most of the marine algae and, and, and zooplankton that we might be used to here and instead they were replaced by opportunistic archaea. So we go back, we go and, and, and you see a bloom of these particular sorts of plankton that these days would be associated with deep sea vents and volcanoes and, and really, really difficult places to live. And they're also thought to have been 
extent uh, way back in, in the Paleozoic. So there's, there's a drawdown in this case of a planktonic abundance and diversity and a replacement by these archaea that we see in the organic geochemistry. So in this particular case, we've, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to build a cross section uh, through the stratigraphy here and, and look at what it looks like. We're going to tie it down with biostrat and look at a bit at the, the geochemistry as well as the organic geochemistry to get a, a, a snapshot through this particular interval. And what we have is through central Texas, we've got um, a, an uplift here. You can see the pink colors are associated with granite. And then we've got the, the sedimentary system that's onlapping that particular uplift. And that uplift was, was there back in the Cretaceous. We've got some also some volcanoes associated with it there. And we've got an onlap of, of beach deposits onto, onto that particular uplift. So we've got, we've got the onlap point pinned and we can go down uh, basinward uh, down to the, the Southeast. And we've got several cores in the subsurface as well as seismic that we can look at here. And I've got uh, the cores and the outcrops circled there that we used to put these uh, cross sections together. And in a broader sense, we are looking um, at this interval here that I'm circling um, with the cursor, this first big black shale event in between these large carbonate shelves here. And there's all these different formation names here. We'll just kind of lump them together and, and call it the OAE 1A and 1B set here. But there's all different sort of formation names here. So when we put all of our, our core and, and outcrop uh, together and we tie that together with seismic, this is, uh, this is what we come up with in terms of what the depositional system look like. And, and what we have here is, is pretty interesting because we have, uh, uh, rather than uh, certainly uh, the faces that would be associated with deep water, where there's a lot of black shale. Instead, when we come and find ourselves pinned up against that uh, igneous uplift, instead of that, we find um, really mixed clastic uh, carbonate systems here, and even some paleosols, right? So we've got beach deposits, uh, mixed, mixed, mixed uh, clastics and carbonates, and beach deposits. A lot of things that you would certainly not associate with major sea level rise. These, these sorts of deposits instead, uh, you might uh, associate with very, very shallow water systems. What you don't find though, are, are healthy carbonate producers. Instead, really uh, sort of the, the only carbonate producers we find in this particular interval are oysters. And then if we go further offshore, we've got oysters, uh, some microbial dominated system and some corals. And that's just about all. It's not, it's not extremely diverse. It doesn't seem to be very healthy and, um, the interval uh, oscillates between these restricted carbonate settings and shale, right? And so uh, once you get uh, sort of below storm wave base, uh, you're, you're collecting a lot of marly shale here. And once we get out of this particular interval that's associated with this anoxic event, we transition back into the healthy carbonate system that we had previously. So this is a pretty, it's a pretty interesting system. And, and one of those things that uh, allows you to sort of walk some of these uh, particular deposits from where they might classically be studied in the basin all the way up to the beach where they pinch out. So you can, you can start to get an understanding of what, what a black shale looks like at the beach, right? And that, that's, a, that's a pretty interesting thing because again, if we're, if we're talking about uh, how we would classically understand uh, black shales, they would simply be the distal portion of a, a depositional system. And as we, we come up towards the beach and towards the land, we would predict we, we come through your classical carbonate depositional system uh, with a lagoon and, and a reef and the tidal flats and all that. And none of that's there, not at all. Instead, you have a few little uh, oyster bioherms and a transition into reworked biohermal material and, and then shale right when you get into the, into the um, past the wave base. So here's a, an instance where we can, we can walk through a, a sequence here um, of, of the shale that's associated with OAE1A. When we, when we go offshore, uh, we, we, uh, we find this particular shale, it's named the Pine Island Shale. And as we transition a little bit more inboard, this becomes a little bit more marly. You can see uh, one or two of these, these flat uh, shaped 
Brutus here, they're very, very rare, but you get a few of them. Uh, the shells of those Brutus are very, very uh, gracile and very thin, so that you, you would interpret that as not an organism that could withstand a lot of, um, of wave activity. So these, these were living in, in relatively quiescent uh, settings. And then as we transition inboard, there's some, there's some reworked material and conglomerates. The reworked material, we, we don't find any evidence of, of Cretaceous carbonates in, in this particular material. It's, it's, it's older carbonates uh, material. And then uh, some, more, some, some more conglomerate uh, inboard there. And the, the, the neat thing about, about this system is that we're able to actually go to, to certain settings and, and walk on the Cretaceous beach here. So we're, we're able to, to see what it must have been like there. This particular uh, area is a park a lot of people like to go. It's called Pedernales Falls State Park. And again, it's, it's right near Austin. And it's one of those places I've been a lot of times um, to look at, at the Pennsylvanian carbonates that are there. And you'll see here in this, this middle section, you've got the Pennsylvanian carbonates that are dipping, oh, about 15, 20 degrees off to the right. Okay? And the neat thing about those is that you can see uh, these, these massive incronites, these crinoid dominated grainstones, and, and they're all pretty rad and all that. But the one thing I never did was shift my eyes about 10 degrees up, because what you can see here then is there's a wave cut terrace and an onlap of the Cretaceous carbonates onto the Pennsylvanian, right? So that, that is the, the actual Cretaceous beach that, that you, can, you can walk along here. And there's some flat pebble conglomerates in here and all that. And then right as you, you step outboard, you, you've, got, um, you've, got, you've got more, more wave dominated sedimentary structures and, and probably half a kilometer out from that, you transition back into shale. I mean, it's very, very quick. And so we don't, we're, one of the nice things about this outcrop is it's, it's one of those lynch points that we're able to say, okay, um, from a, a sequence stratigraphic perspective, we're able to prove that the black shales are not associated with any sort of sea level rise with regards to shallow water environments migrating up dip and producing the same sediments in a different place. Instead, uh, those environments are completely gone and the sediments that might be associated with uh, the shallow water environments are completely different. And we think that that's probably because uh, the, the anoxic event that's, that's related to the Aptal Albion completely shut the, the carbonate production off. And so uh, this is, these are the, the uh, this is a block diagram of the different sorts of um, deposits that we think uh, were occurring at the time. Uh, we start off with a rimmed shelf, and this would be sort of a classic uh, carbonate uh, environment where you would have um, and beautiful beaches like you can think of in the Bahamas, they transition into very, very shallow water deposits, not more than 10 or 20 feet deep, that would go on for miles and miles and miles. And you would finally reach a reef rim at the edge and that would transition into very deep water slope faces very quickly. Um, but, in, but initially during the OAE, what you have is a die off of these organisms. They don't backstep at all, they just completely die. And on top of, of them are, are shales that then transition to, uh, to conglomerates up dip. There's then a, a, an initial slight recovery uh, in between uh, that, that is dominated, like I say, by oysters. That's, that's almost all you see. And then a, a, another, another phase of organic rich def deposition here when we get to this OAE-1B event and finally subsequent recovery into the next uh, carbonate phase. But, but in no case in here, do we, do we find evidence uh, for regional sea level rise or drowning of, of the carbonate platform? In terms of biostratigraphy, um, we're able to lock this down as OAE1A and, and OAE1B uh, through the occurrence of, of different nanofossils. Uh, of course, like I mentioned, um, there, there's uh, quite a bit of environmental disturbance here. I won't go too deep into this. We can talk about it uh, later over a coffee or a beer if you want. Um, but just to say that there are several crises that are usually associated with these anoxic events, and you'll see very, very special opportunistic organisms take over during those times. Where your normal organisms that you would have seen will go extinct, they'll just disappear immediately from the rock record, and you'll have uh, opportunistic other organisms come in, whether it's OAE1 or OAE2. Okay, and so we're able to then tie these intervals together here uh, through core. And of course, 
Um, our eyes were, were always tied to these shales anyway, and, um, and that ended up being a, a good choice as, um, as, as a tie point. So let's get into the, the, the geochemistry then. Uh, we did uh, quite a bit of work in, in core and outcrop. The core was, of course, uh, better preserved and cleaner, so we did uh, most of the geochemical analyses on, on this. In this particular study, I think we had, I have written up there around 6,000 measurements, but I think we ended up with, with closer to 10,000 when it was all said and done. And, and most of these uh, measurements would have to do uh, not just with, with isotopic measurements, but the data set also includes uh, quite a bit of, of rare earths that would, um, and trace metals as well, that would have been uh, reacted to uh, different phases of oxygenation. And so here's, here's one of the examples here. This particular well is one of the most outboard that we had. And, and a couple of the things I wanted to point out to you here um, was is the, this first, we, we associate with the, these anoxic events uh, with increases in TOC. And of course, um, normally in, in carbonic producing environments, you don't have a lot of TOC preserved, probably because uh, most of the organisms when they die, um, are, they decompose and, and the organic matter is, is oxidized away. But in this particular instance, uh, we've got uh, TOCs north of about 2%, which on, in a shallow shelf is quite a bit actually. And, and, and so we, we've got that evidence there uh, along with the biostratigraphy. We've also got uh, the isotopic record. You can see a bit of an excursion in some of, the, in some of these intervals. And then up here where the 1B interval occurs, um, there's, there's an interesting set of excursions here where the bulk carbonate uh, excursion is negative like we would expect and the bulk uh, organic fraction is positive. So they, those excursions cross. And the reason that is, is because um, we think that the, the ocean atmosphere system was uh, affected by, uh, by volcanism, but the, the organic material then, uh, the carbon there was fractionated by archaea, which tend to favor heavier carbon. So that, that tends to be one of the things you see uh, in OAE1b. Uh, also, uh, quite a bit of the, 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 the trace metals here show evidence for uh, anoxic and suboxic uh, 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 settings and, 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 and those sorts of things. So this is just a zoom in to look at the, at the, uh, at the isotopes here. Uh, but just in terms of, of the proxies to, to summarize it, uh, again, we've got uh, isotopes that are following generally a, a secular trend, except at the particular intervals we're looking at. So we've got evidence uh, through the isotope excursions uh, and an elevated TOC that we are indeed crossing uh, these anoxic events. And, and so there may be a genetic relationship between the sediments we see and those particular events uh, that we're looking at. In terms of redox proxies, there are several of them here. And, and again, I won't go through the, the list. You can, you can look at these yourselves, but uh, manganese, molybdenum, vanadium, cobalt, and nickel are all suggesting uh, that we have uh, suboxic uh, settings, if not anoxic settings uh, in, in certain areas. And, and that's worth paying attention to. Finally, uh, we looked at the organic geochemistry uh, within uh, the, the succession. And organic geochemistry is one of those fields that tends to be siloed from the rest of geology. And I'm not necessarily sure why. Um, if certainly, if we're going to, to look at, um, at things like uh, macro fossils, there's no reason why we, we may not want to look at molecular fossils too. And, and, and sort of molecular paleontology could be another way you could think of organic geochemistry, especially when we're, we're, we're looking in the geologic past. So, so one of the things that we looked at here uh, was, was measuring the, the components that are left within the organic fraction um, in, in the residues of some of these uh, higher TOC intervals. And usually uh, the things that are going to be left behind are, are some of the lipids from the membranes of, of, these, of these particular organisms that are a little bit tougher and harder to break down. And so you don't, you don't end up, of course, with whole sequences of DNA or anything like that. What you end up with are little chunks of, of the membrane, for instance, of a bacteria or an algae or in this case, we see a big spike in, um, in, in some of these uh, isoprenoids that are associated with archaea. And that's especially true in this interval around OAE1b. And all of that is to say uh, 
that in this particular study, we see a, a complete rearrangement, not just of the macro scale sedimentary system, where we go from uh, uh, beautiful uh, carbonate producers into, into very restricted, uh, non-diverse uh, sort of settings. But of course, we see the same thing in the water column. The, the plankton that were feeding the entire system, all of them disappear and they, be, they become sort of monospecific. And in this particular case, we change over from having uh, quite a bit of stearines in the system, uh, which are associated usually with marine algae, uh, to, to whole paints that are associated uh, with very shallow, shallow water anoxia, and isoprenoids that are associated mostly with the presence of archaea. So that's evidence also that, that the, the, the water column was suffering as well. So it wasn't just uh, the benthos, it was also uh, the planktonics uh, uh, setting there was suffering through these particular events. And, and of course, all of those things are linked, aren't they? Um, all the way from, from the sediment water interface all the way up to the, to the top of, of the water column. So the idea was that, that through these per particular events, uh, we had uh, uh, green sulfur bacteria and cyanobacteria uh, they, were, they were able to survive of uh, hydrogen sulfide uh, within the photic zone. So the normal thing we would see here is our, our, our no, there would normally be green algae uh, uh, predominantly, but in this particular case, um, the, the organic geochemistry is, is telling us, as a matter of fact, that's not the case. Uh, in the whole paint fraction, we're able to see uh, a pickup of evidence of, uh, of green sulfur bacteria, as well as uh, aryl isoprenoids that uh, have to do more with um, the presence of um, of these uh, very very ancient organisms that are that are still found in some uh, some places on Earth. So again, the, the organic geochemistry is telling us that there's evidence for rapid turnover of the organic system, uh, particularly in the planktonic community. And you can imagine that uh, certainly if the planktonic community were disrupted today that would have a huge follow-on effect for anything that's eating plankton, and then the things that are eating, the things that are eating the plankton, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all, all the way down to um, the, the largest animals that might be there. And of course, that, that's, that's why we think that there's, a, there's extinction uh, of a lot of these sorts of organisms uh, throughout these, these, sorts of, these sorts of intervals. So the implications here, and, and the conclusions of this particular sort of uh, a situation is that we, we effectively are, are accumulating evidence to, to start challenging a model. And the model that, that is typically one uh, that, would be, that would be thought of uh, for the, the occurrence of these black shales, particularly in, in the Mesozoic greenhouse, are, the, are, are ones that would be associated uh, with this block diagram on the right. And this block diagram, again, um, is sort of a classic sort of sequence stratigraphic, what we might call a slug model. And again, uh, we don't need to get into to a lot of nomenclature. The, the, the general point is that as sea level rises, uh, those organisms that are, are sort of locked into specific water depth environments are simply going to track that sea level through time. As sea level rises, they're going to track that shallow water inboard and if sea level falls are going to track that same environment outward right and so then all the environments that are associated with them laterally also shift back and forth and back and forth so that in a, a vertical sense for instance if if we just had a core through here outboard what we would see is shallow water ramp deep water ramp shallow water and so then we would start to think okay if we have shallow water, and then we transition vertically into ramp facies here, it must be getting deeper. And then if we're in deep water facies, black shales, that must mean that the shallow water facies have migrated inboard. So our prediction would then be, well, we can't see this now, but because we've gone from a shallow water situation to a deep water situation, all of our shallow water facies must occur up dip, right? That's the prediction, right? And then as, as we travel up through the core, we arrive back to shallow water facies where the, 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 the depositional system has migrated back out tracking sea level. But that's not the case, at least in this particular situation. And I think there's a lot of evidence to show that uh, within, within Mesozoic systems, um, there's a big control on Mesozoic carbonate systems 
by these anoxic events. And that is that when we go through a similar sort of vertical profile, we go from these sort of shallow water carbonates in through what looks like deep water shales, right? And so if we, if we, if we were using the same sort of slug model, the idea would be, okay, I get it. We, we're in, we go from shallow water, maybe 10 feet water depth, 10 meters max, and then we, we find something that's pelagic. Okay, uh, now we're in a, an area where maybe it's a thousand feet deep, I don't know. Um, so that must mean the shallow water system has migrated up dip. We've now gone and investigated some intervals that were up dip. We could put our finger on the beach where the beach actually on left right onto the land in the Cretaceous time. And we don't find any of this, it's not there. Instead, we find a, a very, very sick, a, a, a very uh, monospecific assemblage of organisms uh, where not a lot of things were able to live. The diversity and the density of organisms was very, very low. And um, there was a lot of, there was a lot of shale. There was, but there certainly wasn't a lot of, of organic material or, or organic uh, activity, I should say, within, within the benthic realm. You see very little burrowing. You, you see very little uh, evidence of, of those sorts of things. So, so what we're trying to do is suggest that this particular model, at least for a lot of Mesozoic carbonates, may not be the best one uh, to hang your hat on. Instead, we need to understand that because of ecological change associated with a large scale uh, carbon cycle perturbations really was able to shut down uh, the carbonate producing uh, ecosystem here. And it wasn't until these particular events ended that uh, the, the ecosystem was able to recover and continue sediment. And that's only for OAE1A and OAE2, for instance, um, that event was so severe that the carbonates never recovered. And that's why if you go to the Texas coast today, you don't see these same carbonates anymore. They died at the end of OAE2 and that was the end of them, right? Otherwise we have Club Med on the Texas coast right now, but we don't. Uh, the Bahamas, for whatever reason, right about the axis of Florida, um, they all survived this event. And so you could drill down to the, through the Bahamas and they've done it. And you can find these same black shale deposits from the same time but they recover from the event, probably because the Proto-Atlantic had enough circulation to let them recover and they continue sedimenting to today. But in, in the ancestral Gulf of Mexico, that's not the case. These particular events um, knocked out the carbonate producing system. And why is, why is that important for us now? Anyone have any ideas? We talk about, uh, you certainly see this in the newspaper recently. Um, Carbon sequestration that may be one of the reasons we might want to do carbon sequestration. But has, has anyone heard of this, this thing called, um, what is it, uh, coral bleaching or ocean acidification, any of these sorts of terms? We see a lot of the same evidence for that, that particular sort uh, uh, of fallout in these particular deposits, right? Where, where we have entire suites of organisms, especially very sensitive organisms in reefal communities completely die off, like a light switch, right? And, and of course that's in geologic time. And we're talking, when I say a light switch, that could be a quarter million years, but to your eye in, in the outcrop, that's one layer above the next, right? So um, of course the situation here in the, in the Mesozoic greenhouse is not the same as we find ourselves in today, but I think it's, it's worth noting and it's worth fair warning. Uh, to look at the geologic past and think about what the implications could be for today. We certainly do that with, with other deposits, volcanoes around here, right? So we see volcanic deposits and we understand that the cascades will erupt again and we need to be ready for that. And the same thing uh, could be said for, for intervals like this. When we look in the geologic past, we can see evidence for, for catastrophes like this. And maybe we want to take a bit of a warning uh, from those. Um, but it is kind of neat sometimes to, to look at um, when, when you're spoiled with data like this. Uh, during these particular OAEs, you can do, for instance, straddle slicing uh, along the events, and you can see all these little uh, coral buildups then sort of on, on the margin edge, where before that, this would have been just completely populated by rudus. You have these little tiny patch reefs all over the place of, of these opportunistic corals. These, these, are, these are little patch reefs in the Bahamas. And their geometry is not all that different there in, in the Comanche Shelf during OAE1A. So you can, you can see evidence for these types of deposits in outcrop. You can see it in core. 
and you can see it in seismic. And, um, and gosh, if, if you can see it on that kind of a scale, and there's a, your scale bar down there, I think that's what, 10, 12 kilometers across. Um, you can imagine that, that these are pretty wide ranging severe deposits um, or severe events, I should say, that affected uh, sort of a range of depositional settings in the geologic past, right? So I think I've, I've, I've gone over most of these uh, conclusions just kind of talking through the slides, um, but I'd be happy to welcome uh, any questions here and uh, go into any more detail or less detail, if you like. Thanks very much. Good. Thanks, Rob. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask in the audience here first? Should I see one there? Sure. It's absolutely great presentation. I love all the connection between environments and, and uh, deposition. But I did see a Kalichi right. that was listed there, and that's in terms of paleo salt. So right. that was uh, so the sea level was much lower. Right. How thick was that? I mean, what, what's your interpretation about it? Yeah, that caliche gets up to two meters thick. Wow. Uh, and born. Right. And there, there's a paper uh, on that particular caliche and the, the, the paleosols that are bounding it uh, by a fellow named Greg, Lud Greg Ludvigson. He's out at the University of Kansas. And he'd done that study actually in the late 90s. And um, that particular study, he didn't, he didn't know that he was... Uh, straddling the after Albion boundary when he did this study. Um, but uh, since the work we were doing and some others um, has sort of bound that together uh, biostratigraphically, we, we contacted Greg and, and he uh, was able to show us through the isotopic work he'd done, not just through the caliche, but through the pedogenic carbonates uh, in, in the paleosols bounding that particular uh, BKM horizon, that you could actually track the, the same carbon isotope excursion wow. through the pedogenic carbonate uh, once it was corrected, of course. And, and that, was, that was pretty interesting to see. Uh, but that, that particular publication, I would say was one of the first that was documenting um, that these oceanic anoxic events were, were inexorably tied to uh, the atmosphere as well. And that you, you could find evidence for that through the pedogenic carbonate. Me? Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, go ahead, Ben. So I've always been reluctant to accept the OAE theories um, for a number of reasons, one of which, uh, particularly when you're calling on stagnation of the basin, how do the phytoplankton get enough nutrients if there's no upwelling? Sure. And, and you did say something about you know, volcanic sources, uh, so perhaps a terrestrial source of nutrients coming in there. Do, is there enough evidence for climate models and for the terrestrial geology to, to suggest there would be enough transport to, to support the kind of you know, phytoplankton blooms to get those thicknesses of, of black shale? I think that's absolutely a fair question. And, and I don't, I think that there, there are two, two ways to answer it. First of all, I would say that when we talk about uh, oceanic stagnation, it's, it, it's important, it's important to, to know that that would not have been the case everywhere. Right. Um, I, I think I think when when these sorts of terms come out, we we tend to to sort of to say them based on studies of one or two outcrops, maybe even a dozen outcrops. And is that is it reasonable to assume that the entire planet was that way? Absolutely not. So I, I think I think first of all we need to we need to take our medicine and understand that uh, we can't say that this was a, 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 that the environment was the same everywhere. That's obviously not the case, uh, but. Uh, yeah, there, there is, there's quite a bit of evidence through, um, through studies of certainly rubidium and strontium isotopes uh, that suggest there was at least increased hydro hydrologic cycle and uh, an increase uh, in, in, in nutrients, not just from, the, from volcanics, but, but from uh, increased hydrologic cycle bringing material off the continents and into the ocean during this particular time. Uh, certainly, uh, the sediments are far more radiogenic at that stage, suggesting that um, your, your, your bi your, there's an increase in material that's washing off uh, continental shields, uh, for instance. Uh, but you know, you make a good point, and I, I, I feel like um, it's one of those things where when you, when you get into looking at this, these particular events are certainly far more complicated than, than a simple event, and, and they're not the same everywhere. And so, uh, so 
Yeah. That, that, that is a very fair answer. Um, another issue is we're getting to the, the complications of these systems. Uh, we looked at some black shale sequences, the bio shale, for instance, and using the metal ratios, we, we've seen, as you did, one that's the anoxic, suboxic, even oxic. Mm -hmm. There's no you know, no reason that, that you can't have accumulation of organic material in the it, and I you know my argument's always been it's the it's the blooming maybe the uh, increased uh, offshore winds and, and increased uh, upwelling currents is that blooming that you know that comes first the anoxia is a result of that yeah and a lot of people seem to argue the other way around it, it, but but I saw you you did have. Uh, you know your, your plots of the metals uh, with, uh, various intersections. Are are those totals? Yeah. So I think some some of them some of them are ratios. But well, yeah. uh, did Harry Rowe do that? Yeah, he did all. Of them. Yeah. He probably should know to do this, and he may have. One way you can get rid of those is, is to actually you know, to do some, some statistics and, and essentially um, take away the trial signal. Hmm. And oftentimes, because I don't see much of a kick in your molybdenum, no. which if it did an oxic setting, I would think that you'd be going into your sulfide. Sure. And so you'd be enriched in those sediments. So one way is to get rid of that the trial signal. So you're only looking at the biogenic and hydrogen. Uh, so that might be something. Yeah, fair point. I, I'd like to, to answer some of your previous points, if, if I may as well. Uh, one of the, the main complicating factors in these particular events is there's often a decoupling uh, between the highest organic content in these particular OAE associated shales and the actual isotope excursions. And that's not something I'm touching in this talk, but it's certainly something that people are recognizing, I would say, within the past five years. Um, when, when people, for instance, had started to work on the Eagle Ford, you might be familiar with this, um, most people had presumed before anyone had done any carbon isotopes that the OAE was the lower high TOC portion. And once, once people actually did the isotopes, they found out that actually that's not true. Uh, the OAE comes after that. It, and, and in many cases, the, the isotope excursion postdates the black shale. And um, sometimes it sandwiches the black shell. We get two of them. And so, so that particular story is, is, again, like you're probably pointing out, quite a bit more complicated than, uh, than was, was pointed out many years ago by, uh, by Hugh Jenkins and others. Yeah. Very nice. So really interesting. I love that. Okay. So that you, you have a paper on this? Um, on this you note, I've, I've done some, some AAPG presentations. I think some people have some papers. I, I've written papers more on the organic side than I have on the, the inorganic geochemistry. So it's a hell of a desk. Yeah, it's pretty good, yeah. So it's the paper that you had published this summer in, um, in scientific reports is that, that's also on an anoxic event, but what, it's got a different focus. Yeah, so I, I published a paper with some colleagues in uh, scientific reports um, where we were looking at the, so we were quantifying the, or, the, organic the organic material change through OAE2, which is the Cinnamon and Turonian version of this. And what we were finding was uh, massive swings in, the, in the, the absolute components of uh, lots of different um, molecular fossils, uh, up to 40% up to plus swings through, through the Cinnamon within the same phases. So we tied ourselves to, to the same phases as best we could. And what we were finding was that, that although, for instance, um, uh, we were able to track uh, in any sort of trace metal or other proxy uh, for redox conditions held pretty stable, the actual organic fraction did not. And, and there seemed to be quite a bit of swinging and pulsing in the ability of these uh, organisms to survive. So they were undergoing several hits of what might have, we're positing it could be volcanogenic, uh, but we don't know for sure. Uh, it's, it's only the, the point of that paper was really more to say that when you look into the organic fraction, the story is far more complicated than when you're just looking, for instance, at the isotopes, which is already complicated enough. Right? So, um, um, but, but that was, it was one of those things that, 
looking at organic geochemistry as a stratigrapher is not something that's normally done and it's not cheap either. And, and so that's one of the reasons those sort of uh, studies haven't, haven't really come out, but yeah, I, I've done something like that. So a lot of my work would be sort of on data integration and, and a bit more on the organic side and maybe on the holistic carbonate side. And, and most of uh, the colleagues that I uh, showed at the beginning of the paper, Harry and some others, Osman and some others, uh, would be looking more at the, the inorganic geochemistry here. Any other questions out there for Rob? I just have one. Oh, you're going? Yeah. Okay. I, uh, so there's this massive data of what happened to all the evidence of that life you know, tried in a short period of time. Part of the areas of yeah okay so, yeah um let me, let me see if i if i've understood the question right you're asking um if there's if there's if there's extinction or a big die-off why why is why does the sediment remain seemingly undisturbed is that it i think so yeah it's like there's no fossils physical evidence of yeah, and, and, and I think I think you're sort of pointing at it sort of halfway. Um, and so so the, the question is, again, uh, if there were a large number of, of die offs, why do we not have a pile of dead animals there? Is that it? Um, that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Um, well, the, 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 the way I would answer that is carbonate organisms grow in place. So when you have carbonate organisms, when you see them, they're already dead. Right, so and when when we when we see them, they're go, they're dead, they're dead, they're dead, they're dead, and then they're not there at all. So it's not that they they were living and then they we see that they died. Everything we see is already dead, right? So um, so we we then we we look at the taxa that are there. So for instance, if we're going through uh, some Aptian reefs, we see that they're full of these rutus, and then when we cross into the absolute Albion boundary, the, there's just no more rutus at all. It's black shale now, right? And then whatever reefs we do see have a few rootus, but they're mostly coral. So the, the diversity of the organisms has shifted completely over to a different thing, right? Yeah, so, so that's, that's the thing. It's not that all this was floating in the water column and then it dies and you've got a big pile of dead stuff, right? The, the pile of dead stuff you can think of as the black shale. The reason that it's got a lot of organic material in it is, is because the plankton that were living within the water column were dying and they were falling down and then they were preserved. They didn't decompose per se. The, the organic material was, was stayed, stayed in place and that's why we have higher proportions of TOC. And one of the reasons that the shale is black is because it's got organic material in it. Yeah, yeah, so, it, but it's not easy. And, and he was making the point earlier is that you, you've got a sort of chicken and egg scenario, right? And uh, one, one thing you could think of is if there's a bloom of this plankton, uh, when it dies, it could, it could decompose, it could drive so much decomposition that you, you remove the oxygen from the system because of the decomposition, and then that creates the anoxia. Another way you could think of it is that the anoxia happens first, and then dead things fall to the ocean floor and are preserved because it's anoxic. So you've got this chicken and egg scenario, and I don't get into that battle. I'm happy to let it <laughs> Okay, well, let's go ahead and stop it there. Um, I do want to mention that after this, we're going to head to the library tap house and kitchen, which is the little spot where you can get drinks, etc. Uh, as part of the Carl Miller Center on the southeast side, 6th and Harrison, if you know what I'm talking about. So yeah, if you want to continue the discussion, join us over there. But thank you, everybody, for coming. Let's thank Ron once again. For thank you. I'll also just